What we've seen in our work is actually that there's many different definitions and the main problem is that there is no internationally agreed definition of what actually constitutes climate finance. And so in our discussions with many experts, what we found is that it captures many different elements. It captures mitigation and adaptation, capacity building, it captures various geographical directions, so it captures south-south flows, north-south flows, domestic flows, very importantly. It captures investment capital and incremental costs, and it captures both can be counted in, in gross terms, which means all the flows in a year, uh, or in net terms, which means you, you deduct uh, the amount that needs to be repaid from a country. And so what we decided to, also again, in line with many expert opinions, to, to uh, use the climate finance term for, is actually all climate finance flows that are specifically targeted targeted to do uh, activities that allow to get us on a low carbon climate resilient pathway. And we do that uh, in our work currently still uh, on in gross terms, which means we're trying to understand what is the overall scale of climate finance. And we're looking at incremental cost and at investment capital as well, because we do think it makes sense to understand what are the different dimensions there. Uh, but I do think it is really a, a concept that is evolving and we need to be very clear on what we count and very transparent what is being counted because it can be very confusing in comparing different uh, figures for climate finance that are being produced by different institutions and organizations. The first report we did on climate finance is the one we published in 2011, which looked at, uh, for the first time, the most comprehensive picture of climate finance flows uh, with a particular focus on north-south flows. So we were looking primarily on climate finance, so financial flows addressing uh, climate change from developed to developing countries. And what we found there is that on average 97 billion US dollars was being spent in 2009-2010 uh, so on an annual basis uh, to address climate change. And this is a significant number, but I want to make sure that this is not being confused with the 100 billion of the Copenhagen Accord, where developed countries have promised developing countries 100 billion, because what we show in our report is really a comprehensive snapshot of what currently is being provided to address climate change. In our update of this report in 2012, we went beyond the scope of the 2011 study and we actually significantly expanded the geographic scope and went beyond the focus from the developed to developing countries, but really look at global uh, flows where we also look at um, better capture the nature and magnitude of flows between and within countries. And most importantly, we also better untangle the private flows, so really trying to understand where money is coming from and where money is ending up. And in this 2012 study, we find that on a global basis, 364 billion US dollars are currently being spent on, on climate change activities. And uh, this is, uh, again, quite significant number, but at the same time, what we know is that it's still falling far short of what is actually needed in order to address the challenge of getting us on a low carbon climate resilient pathway. In fact, uh, the International Energy Agency has predictions that uh, we need annually around one trillion US dollars just to address climate change in the energy sector. So you can see that there is a huge financing gap that is out there and that we need to fill. Again, from our work, uh, what are some of the most significant areas where we think uh, we can learn from and actually in order to scale up climate finance is first one, uh, private uh, capital, private finance is the dominant uh, contributor at the moment to climate finance. So we need to find um, well-designed, well-articulated public policies that can unlock large pools of private capital. And we've seen in a few case studies that we've done uh, again, in some of our reports, that actually there are many examples of how well-articulated public policies can really trigger and mobilize additional private finance. A second finding I'd like to stress is that 
there is a number of actors from which we can learn uh, again and whose experiences are essential in scaling up climate finance. In our report we found that public and private intermediaries, financial institutions, have been channel uh, channeling and raising about a third of the overall climate finance at the moment. And they do so uh, by having also very good relationships with local actors, and very good relationships with the domestic, private sector. And this shows us again that we can learn from these institutions in order to further scale up and really learn the experience from the experiences in order to implement additional scaling up of climate finance. I found this experience extremely useful. I think it was an excellent uh, workshop platform to bring together very different actors. And I think what I've learned is actually more reinforcing a few initial findings we had from early research. And uh, the first one here is that the importance of domestic public actors and the importance of both uh, domestic governments, uh, governments and, and the budgets that they have in order to mainstream let's finance into their budgets and their plans but also the importance of domestic financial institutions in really taking a key role in scaling up climate finance. And the second thing that I, I've learned or that has been reinforced through the, through the interactions at this workshop was the importance of risk in actually scaling up climate finance. So what we see in our work is that risk, uh, whether perceived or real, is the most single most important factor preventing money actually to flow into green investments. And we've seen that there is a mismatch, there is a gap between the demand for risk coverage from investors in, in the context of green investments and the supply of risk mitigation instruments to cover the risks that are specifically related to green projects. And I do see that there is a window of opportunity for the public sector or for development finance institutions to actually fill that gap and come up with new or innovative risk mitigation instruments to actually fill the gap and, and scale up finance effectively. Mm -hmm.